In this video, we're going to look at movement disorders, and uh, we're going to focus on Parkinson's and Huntington's, but we're going to do a little general introduction about what the different types of movement disorders are. So movement disorders are neurologic syndromes with either hypokinetic or hyperkinetic voluntary or autonomic movements. Um, they're unrelated to weakness or spasticity, uh, which we saw in things like MS and ALS. Um, and they're divided into two major categories. So hyperkinetic movement disorders, we call these dyskinesias. Uh, and this is accompanied by excessive, often repetitive, involuntary movements uh, that intrude into the normal flow of motor activity. So a person, their normal walking and arm movements and whatnot have these extra hyperkinetic movements added on top of that. Hypokinetic movement disorders, uh, this is akinesia, lack of movement, or hypokinesia, which is reduced amplitude of movements, or bradykinesia, slow movement, or rigidity, which we see in Parkinson's. These would all be examples of hypokinetic movement disorders. And they can be primary, in other words, resulting from damage, for example, to the basal ganglia. We'll look at that in detail. Uh, or manifestation of some other systemic or neurological disease. So we say that's secondary. So primary versus secondary movement disorders. A couple of terms which are important to know uh, because you see these a lot in the context of movement disorders. So atetosis uh, means slow writhing movements, especially in the fingers. And this is pretty characteristic of Huntington's disease. We'll look at that here shortly. And this is always an issue of damage to the basal ganglia. Remember the basal ganglia are a deep cortical region. Um, and this is essentially a motor regulation center. And so they're helping to filter unwanted movements. Um, uh, those, all those motor impulses descending from the cortex down to the brainstem, they help to uh, filter and regulate those. And if you're a little rusty on the basal ganglia, you might want to go back and look at that lecture. Um, so basically, atetosis would present as writhing, snake-like movements. Um, and that's, that's what that means. Chorea is sudden, jerky, purposeless movements. And again, this would be signal of a basal ganglia disorder. Uh, chorea means dancing. So people just suddenly have these hyperkinetic kind of activities. Dystonia is a sustained involuntary muscle contraction, like writer's clamp, cramp or a uh, eyelid cramp. We call that a blep blepharospasm. Um, so when your eyelid starts to cramp, so that's a dystonia. There are many things can ca cause that, so that's not a sign of a basal ganglia problem or anything like that necessarily. Essential tremor is a high-frequency tremor with sustained posture, like an outstretched arm, uh, worsened with movement or when anxious. Uh, so basically, you stretch your arm out, you try to move it a little bit, and you get a shaking, a tremor. That's essential tremor. This is often familial, um, and uh, we don't think this signifies any deeper neurological problems, so we, we consider it to be a fairly benign uh, condition. Uh, but patients will often try to self-medicate with things like alcohol, which actually decreases the, the amplitude of the tremors. And then typically things like beta blockers, which bl block your sympathetic nervous system, are given as uh, potential therapies here. Um, hemibolismus is sudden wild flailing of one arm and uh, one leg, uh, and it's ipsilateral on the same side, so both the arm and leg flail. Um, and this has to do with problems in the contralateral hemisphere in the uh, thalamus. So this has to do usually with lacunar strokes in the subthalamic nuclei, so deep in the nucleus on the contralateral hemisphere to where this hemibolismus is occurring. Uh, usually due to a lacunar stroke. Uh, intention tremor is a slow zigzag motion when pointing or extending towards a target. And uh, that is uh, almost always a hallmark of cerebellar dysfunction. Myoclonus is a sudden, brief, uncontrolled muscle contraction. So that'd be like a hiccup or muscle jerk. Uh, and that's typically more of a metabolic issue, maybe a local electrolyte problem. That could signify more deeper liver and kidney metabolic issues that need to be worked up. So continued myoclonus should get a little bit more of a workup. Uh, but simple muscle jerks and spasms are usually no problem at all. And then there's resting tremor, which is uncontrolled movement of a distal appendage. So that's at rest, you put the arm out and it starts to tremor. Um, and usually when you move the arm, it improves. And that is a uh, classic of Parkinson's. So Parkinson's has a resting tremor, which actually disappears when a person moves.
um, it occurs at rest. It's sort of the, we call pill rolling tremor, uh, kind of just back and forth, almost like you're rolling a pill through your fingers. Um, so that is a hallmark of Parkinson's. Dysarthria is a motor inability to speak. And that it, we already experienced this. We saw this in the brain section. That's often due to damage of the Broca area, um, the pre, premotor cortex areas. Um, and uh, so that is a dysarthria. And aphasia is a higher order inability to speak. So that's a language deficit. So often dysarthria might be accompanied by, or an aphasia might have a dysarthria as part of that. Uh, but that usually involves higher cortical centers when there's an actual aphasia. So we saw that Broca's uh, damage, like a stroke to the Broca's area in the left hemisphere, can result in a non-fluent aphasia. Uh, and um, we, we might clinically characterize that as a type of dysarthria. Uh, apraxia is an inability to perform particular purposeful actions. Um, and there's several types of that. So usually it's due to lesions in the dominant, usually the left hemisphere especially in the frontal and posterior parietal cortex. Um, so that's apraxia. And then ataxia is lack of voluntary coordination of muscle movements. So we usually see that in the clinic as gait abnormalities. So that's ataxia. And that usually signifies either a problem in the cerebellum, that's most common, or the vestibular uh, system, or in the sensory system in your proprioceptors in the muscles, or maybe a spinal cord lesion, which prevents that information from getting to the brain. Um, so there's lots of causes of ataxia, and that needs to be often investigated. Um, dystaxia just means a mild degree of ataxia. All right, so those are common terms. Just be familiar with those um, that are associated with different movement disorders. So let's look first at Parkinson's disease. This is an idiopathic progressive hypokinetic disorder. Uh, it usually begins after the age of 50 to 60. Um, and it really has two aspects to it. One is motor, so the motor aspects of Parkinson's. And uh, we call that, there's a, what's called the Parkinson's tetrad. And that's a resting tremor. So a tremor at rest, these pill rolling tremors of the hand. Muscle rigidity, so we call that cog wheeling where a person uh, they're very jerky and stiff in their movements, like getting up or just walking. Um, so there's rigidity with some tremor there. And then bradykinesia is slow movement with shuffling gait, small steps. They kind of do that almost to keep their balance. And then postural instability. So stooped posture, they often fall or they freeze in their movements. So that's the tetrad of motor deficits in Parkinson's. There could be um, uh, echinesia, which is difficulty in initiating movement. Uh, we call mask-like face, so they lose the kind of emotional content that we often see in the facial, express in the facial muscles. And then micrography is an interesting one. They start to write much, if they write by hand, their handwriting, the letters get smaller and smaller and smaller. And that was actually interesting. I had a patient who uh, we eventually diagnosed with Parkinson's and she came in and said, you know, my sister has been telling me, I write letters to my sister, telling me she's been having more and more difficulty reading my letters. She says the words look too small. Uh, and that was the first kind of symptom. She also had a resting tremor and she had some of the um, uh, rigidity as well uh, present. Now, another aspect of Parkinson's are the neuropsychiatric aspects. So in addition to these motor aspects, we can get sensory deficits, especially in one of the first and earliest signs is olfactory dysfunction. People lose the ability to smell, they smart, start smelling unusual sound, smells. Uh, yeah, so that's a sensory deficit. Cognitive deficits would be loss of executive planning. Uh, so doing higher cognitive aspects like putting organizing one's life, putting all that together. Uh, memory deficits, sleep problems, mood issues with depression, anxiety, and apathy, potentially even psychosis and hallucinations. Uh, and then Parkinson's patients are up to six times more likely to suffer from dementia. There's often some autonomic dysfunction like bladder or bowel control issues. And then sensation of pain, burning, tingling, lancinating pain. So really Parkinson's is affecting the motor aspect, but also their sensory and autonomic and then higher cognitive aspects are involved as well. The prevalence of Parkinson's is about estimated to be about 0.3% of the world's population and in about 1% of all people over 60. So that's about 5 million uh, people worldwide suffer from Parkinson's.
Um, there are several different types. So the primary type is most common. We call that uh, the idiopathic type. There's no identifiable cause. Secondary would be acquired, and that would be acquired from different drugs, toxins, trauma, infections. So for example, there's a haloperidol. Haloperidol is a uh, psychiatric medication induced Parkinsonism. Um, and uh, we'll actually look at that. There's, um, that's a common effect of a particular class of uh, psychiatric medication known as neuroleptics or antipsychotics. So in Parkinson's, what we think is happening is actually in the basal ganglia, there is a loss of dopamine from the neurons that project from the substantia nigra. Remember, this is in the midbrain. These neurons project up to the basal ganglia. They secrete dopamine. So by the time patients present to the clinic with Parkinson's symptoms, we think there's up to over 90% loss of these dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. Um, it turns out that in schizophrenia, there we think there's actually an excess of dopamine. So the medications used to treat schizophrenia block dopamine in the central nervous system. Well, guess what? That triggers Parkinsonism. So that would be a secondary uh, type of Parkinsonism. There is a hereditary type where there's a familial history and a specific gene variance with usually dopamine that are involved. And then there's something called Parkinson's plus syndrome, which is multiple system degeneration. And there's several types, multiple system atrophy, progressive subnuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration. We already saw dementia with Lewy bodies. These would be uh, Parkinson's with other uh, neurodegenerative diseases on top. So Parkinson's mixes with these others. So again, a more advanced neuro, neurological evaluation would be able to pick that up. Um, so again, the pathophysiology involves the basal ganglia, loss of the dopaminergic neurons. And the um, result of that is that nerve impulses coming down uh, from the motor cortex uh, in the cerebrum are not checked, and that results in uncontrolled muscle movements. Uh, here, too, we see abnormal accumulation of uh, proteins within the dopaminergic neurons, and they form what are called Lewy bodies. These are specific deposits, which on certain types of staining you can actually see in those neurons. Again, this would only be visualizable if you did a biopsy of that region, which we only do after a person has died. Um, but um, so that would be one of the hallmarks of similar in that way to Alzheimer's. But here we have a different region of the brain, different neurons being affected. Uh, we think there might be some mitochondrial dysfunction as well. That's where the mitochondria become less effective at putting out ATP. And uh, there's more oxidative stress. They can't clean up the oxidative stress and uh, chronic inflammation and so forth. Iron overload also, basal ganglia accumulates iron and too much iron creates more oxidative damage in that region so that could potentially contribute to that as well. So that's a little bit on Parkinson's. Again, uh, not a lot. There's there's some speculation about therapies from the uh, adjunctive side that might be supportive here, um, but uh, not a lot of research yet. Uh, there's some novel acupuncture procedures. There's one person who's working on the stomach channel using the feet claims they're having very good success with Parkinson's patients, but I haven't seen anything long-term lasting or published in the research literature. Now, in terms of distinguishing Parkinson's from the Parkinson-like syndromes, this can be really challenging. And again, that's where a referral to a neurologist for a full assessment would be important. Um, so our differential diagnosis, again, would be include things like essential tremor, which is the most common action tremor, and we talked about those, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, multiple system atrophy, progressive subnuclear palsy, again, again, et cetera. Uh, we'll look at Huntington's here. And then secondary Parkinson, Parkinsonism due to the, the psychiatric medications, the antipsychotics, uh, or you know, potentially things like hypothyroid, things like that. Um, so that would be all part of the workup that they would go through. The diagnosis is largely based on the history and the clinical impression. Um, there's no blood test or physiologic test available. Imaging is often not that revealing. MRI could be helpful for ruling out other conditions. Um, if a patient has a positive response to the therapies I'll talk about here, that kind of confirms the diagnosis. And um, unfortunately, even with all that, the diagnostic accuracy is pretty low. Um, as low as 75% using the neuropathological examination. So when patients are examined on autopsy after death, they find that actually you didn't have Parkinson's, you had one of these other 
conditions, uh, which maybe needed a different treatment. Um, so um, the treatment itself, we of course would go through levels one and three of the therapeutic order, addressing diet, lifestyle, micronutrients, organ systems, etc. Um, the current uh, pharmacotherapy really address the symptoms only. There is nothing that uh, is known that can repair or reverse the neuronal gen degeneration. And uh, it's really to support the activity of the dopaminergic neurons. So the precursors to dopamine, levodopa, that's L-dopa, that is uh, dopa, dopa is a precursor to dopamine. Uh, levodopa crosses the blood-brain barrier, and the idea is it just gives the neurons more substrate, the ones that are remaining, that 10% or less, more substrate to work with so that they can make more uh, dopamine. Um, the unfortunate thing with uh, L-dopa is that it can be very effective at stopping the symptoms uh, for a while, for several months to a year, but usually within a couple of years, the effects wear off pretty dramatically and the person is unresponsive anymore to any further L-DOPA. There is a source of L-DOPA from a bean, it's called the velvet bean, Mucuna purians, and um, this is a uh, often marketed as a natural alternative to L-DOPA uh, or to levodopa. Um, the problem with the mucuna is that trying to control the amount of L-DOPA in there and everything else is challenging. The benefit is there are other compounds in the velvet bean which actually help support dopa metabolism and uh, that might actually be neuroprotective. So it's kind of a mixed bag, It's kind of, uh, but it's very widely marketed as a uh, L-DOPA or levodopa uh, alternative. Now levodopa is usually given together uh, with carbidopa. So levodopa, carbidopa, this is called cinnamet. And uh, what the carbidopa does is it prevents the breakdown of L-dopa in the GI tract. So it blocks the enzymes. These are MAO, monoamine oxidase enzymes in the GI tract that breaks down levodopa. And so more gets absorbed into the system. Uh, so that's the, the medications commonly used there. There are also dopamine agonists uh, that are again used only in early disease. So uh, the rapinirol goes by the name of Requip, uh, the uh, Premapexol, Mirapex, and so forth, um, uh, the amantadine, etc. All of these can improve some of the short-term symptoms of Parkinson's, um, but uh, the effects usually wear off pretty quickly with time. Interestingly, the rapinirol, for example, in the Mirapex, these are used also for restless leg syndrome, which we think actually involves the basal ganglia, again with a loss or a temporary dysfunction of the dopaminergic neurons. So there's also a role for those drugs for treating RLS. Um, there are medications that prevent the breakdown of dopamine in the central nervous system, and that would be MAOB inhibitors. Um, and uh, that actually taken together with the uh, levodopa carbidopa might decrease the need for that medication. Uh, so the drug here is selegaline. Um, and then there are COMT inhibitors. This is another enzyme that breaks down dopamine. Uh, and that's the entacapone and tolcapone. Um, and so that's sometimes given again with the levodopa carbidopa. Uh, and then there are, we have with Parkinson's sometimes um, uh, effects uh, of excessive cholinergic activity. So unlike Alzheimer's, when you have deficient cholinergic activity, sometimes here you get excess cholinergic activity. And so here, anti-muscarinic agents can be used for that. Um, these are not commonly used because they have a lot of other effects. And as you can imagine, they could actually impair short-term memory and so forth. But sometimes if there's a lot of excessive cholinergic activity, for example, the overactive bladder, if there's a lot of GI, uh, effects and so forth, these are sometimes given. Uh, surgery would involve actual um, surgery to different parts of the brain. Uh, also implanting what are called deep brain stimulators, and these are electrodes that are placed in the basal ganglia that are fired and, and they can sort of mimic the effects of those lost dopaminergic neurons. Um, and then there are you know, adjunctive approaches that kind of look at addressing systemic inflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and systemic toxicity. Um, so that would all be part really of level two and level three therapies in your therapeutic order. So here would be just kind of an overview of the approach to Parkinson's. Finally, I'll just end here with a brief discussion of Huntington's disease. Uh, this is rare, a lot less common than Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's a, this one is a hyperkinetic uh, 
autosomal dominant disease, um, and there is a disorder on chromosome 4. Uh, there is an abnormal, what we call CAG, uh, cytosine adenine guanine triplet repeat on chromosome 4, and this causes progressive breakdown of the nerve cell uh, in the basal ganglia. Uh, the life expectancy is about 20 years from the point of diagnosis, uh, and there are fewer than 200,000 cases in the U.S., but it's important to know about this. Uh, presents between the ages of 30 and 50. And the hallmark here is a uh, sudden onset chorea. And this is sudden onset of purposeless involuntary dance-like movements uh, and altered behavior. There could be dementia with irritability, clumsiness, fidgetiness, moodiness, antisocial behavior, and weight loss and depression. Um, so the diagnosis here is usually the clinical signs and symptoms with the genetic testing on the chromosome four. Um, and uh, we'd see those multiple CAG repeats on chromosome 4. And then imaging CT or MRI, which shows cerebral atrophy, especially in the caudate uh, nucleus and the putamen. Remember, those are all parts of the basal ganglia. Um, so the treatment here would be support, really levels 1 and 3. There's no cure. Uh, the disease progression, unfortunately, can't be halted. Um, and the treatment is really symptomatic only. So to minimize unwanted movements, reserpine could be used. Reserpine is an older medication. Actually, be it used, used previously to block dopamine, uh, used in hypertension, for example. Uh, but this has a role in Huntington's. Uh, atypical antipsychotics, these are second generation. We'll talk about these. They have less Parkinson-like effects, uh, but this can address the psychosis that might accompany Huntington's. SSRI to depression and then genetic counseling should be offered to offspring because they're at higher risk. So again, rare, but um, this would kind of round out our discussion of movement disorders. So that gives you kind of a summary here of uh, Parkinson's, some of the other Parkinson-like syndromes, general approach to Parkinson's, and then uh, Huntington's disease. And again, be familiar with some of the terminology that was discussed around movement disorders as well.